Hello, so before I forget to film for day one of week five? Holy crap, has it been five weeks already? What the heck? So today I was able to finish Sasur's reading and now I'm in almost the almost mid what? I'm almost halfway through Derrida's reading and it's a struggle and you can imagine I struggled with Sasur as well because it was from the Northern Anthology so I was like and like it was about semiology so it was even more like you know that's a struggle but like yeah I plan on finishing that I showered early today miraculously so I have enough time after dinner to just go to town on this <laughs> and and then read that part of the module and then hopefully if I still have energy do the art appreciation module and then if not I'll dedicate tomorrow for art appreciation philosophy but if I can finish it today which I highly doubt then tomorrow before philosophy and and live 32 of which I have a paper due. Did that even... Was that even grammatically correct? I don't know. It's like... What time is it? Okay, um... Wait. I'm rolling down my... Ugh. It's... 10.37. And, yeah. They'll see me in white. <laughs> okay, so yeah. That, that's all, just a quick update for day one of week five, and I hope all of you are doing well and liking the series so far. Like I said, don't forget to in like and subscribe if you want to, and leave a comment or a suggestion down below. Check out my music channel, because you know, more stuff coming there soon. I'm working on a lot of stuff. And hopefully I can get the shop off the ground soon. Mm. Yeah, how are y'all how are you, how are you doing? Uh, I hope you're doing fine. So yeah, see you tomorrow. <laughs> what was that? Soft little baby. What is up? Day two of week five. Right now, I'm about to finish my Derrida text. I have, I think, five more pages to go. And then I'm going to do my art app module. Sophie module because I have a group work for both subjects. <laughs> I'll update you later. I'll update you later. Which is here. Hello, so like I said, I was reading Derrida's Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences from 1970 and This is not my first time reading a Derridean text, but holy crap. Never fails. He never fails to make my brain feel like it's being broken in a million into a million pieces. And wow. Wow. I just all I have to say is that I kind of understand, but as much as I would love to dissect every single part of it, I do not have a time, so that's life as a college student, I think. When you don't understand the text, you just read it, take what you can get, and go, because I got a lot of crap to do, but yeah, I'm sure I will 
uh, understand this better because of the module and when it all connects together in the end with the other text, so. Bye. Hello, so it's still day two, but I'm really enjoying the readings for today and honorable mentions on photography by Susan Sontag. I got some quotes for that that I will probably read at the end of the week. And In Defense of the Poor Image by Hito Steyero. I'm sorry if I butchered that name, but I like it a lot. And the end quote, I highly suggest you read it. It's my favorite part of it is The poor image is no longer about the real thing, the originary original. Instead, it is about its own real conditions of existence, about swarm circulation, digital dispersion, fractured and flexible temporalities. It is about defiance and appropriation, just as it is about conformism and exploitation. In short, it is about reality. Uh, this text basically talks about how um, the poor image signifies a deeper thing in society and the the elitism of a lot of new media and cinema and the high resolution images and how there's a hierarchy of everything i'm summarizing this poorly but i swear it's so good it's only eight pages long and if you have time i highly recommend it it's a really interesting read So good morning, it is day three and I'm here with Fresh Liu Lam. And I'm about to wipe him, his little eyes, like I do every morning. Cause you know, he gets matting, see that? I'm gonna wipe that, and his little booty. And anyways, I just wanted to say, having eczema sucks. Like I've had hand eczema since I was like 17, and the worst one of the worst flare-ups that I've had recently in my hand area was because when I wear dishwashing gloves when some of the water gets inside it and mixed with like the powder my hands have like an allergic reaction so look at this you see how these look normal right normal enough at least <laughs> but then like look at this like do you see how flared up that is and like dry looking like i moisturize it every night too and like this one is like catching it as well and i don't know i just wanted to say it because i don't know it's gross i guess but also i'm i've always been prone to skin allergies so like i don't care so like if you think this is gross then stop watching um yeah so, any of my fellow eczema people there, you're not alone. I also suffer with this, and like, it's hard when like, you you can't, sometimes, there's, can you see that the skin is like super stretched out? Like it doesn't have any more elasticity compared to like this hand. You see that? It's like still soft and supple looking, and this one's like, like, I can't hold this like for a long time without it hurting because like the skin is like way too stretched out but like yeah it hurts because there's no more like moisture barrier uh i can't hold things with a lot of pressure for too long like i can't open bottles or jars without it hurting and i can't grab onto things like i don't know like maybe like if a door is hard to open or something something it's so hard for me to describe right now but another struggle that i have is like when i play guitar or bass and like the pick slips away because you hear that there's no like it's not like this there's no like um moisture to like hold it and it just and i hate it so much and this is like a three minute rant about eczema but it's a nightmare and yeah I have no idea why I'm saying this but 
just, um, I don't know. I just wanted to talk about it because it sucks and it flares up at like the most random times too. So if you have any eczema tips or stories, you can drop them down below. Um, I know it's weird, but uh, it sucks to have it. It's debilitating. And I know that there are people with worse conditions than this, but having something on your hands, my right hand do like. Oh yeah, but have have I told you that that's why I don't really wear lip gloss and lipstick anymore? It's because of my eczema on my lips. It's like a thick patch over here, and it. That's another one that started in the summer of what was that? Twenty nineteen. So, yeah, allergy gang, contact dermatitis check. I just realized I didn't even finish this story from a while ago of like why this hand <laughs> this is flaring up. Cause that, that, this part of the glove, the, that finger had a hole in it. And I just like tried to like live with it for a few days. So boom. And it's so itchy and eczema is like self, self-perpetuating or something like that. So it gets worse the more you touch it. So also there's like no cure. You can like make it calm down and like make it less inflamed. But anytime it comes in contact with that thing, it will always come back. So like what, the best thing you can do is just keep it moisturized and don't scratch it. Luna, help me. Luna. Luna also has allergies. He's just a little baby. He's allergic to neem oil. So, um, that's another thing. If you have, um, if you're gonna try Madre de Cacao products, they sometimes mix neem oil in there because of its um, anti-flea properties. So check on that if your dog's allergic because Lulam's allergic to neem oil. You can hear him breathing. Hello, it is still day three of week five and I just wanted to say hello because I'm about to finish my art appreciation module, then do my philosophy module, and then contribute to the group work, and in the next few days, oh, I have to do the the group work and the paper in the next few days for under 32 and 42. <laughs> it's almost midterm season and I'm so scared, yo! I'm so scared! You'd think that after first semester I'd be confident enough to do whatever, but... You never know what to expect. I'm honestly terrified, but... It's life as a college student. <laughs> In the, in the Panda Express. Uh. Oh yeah, also I washed my hair, so. Um, no grease today. This isn't the chum bucket. <laughs> okay, um. Yeah, I'm gonna do my <laughs> appreciation module now. So, yeah, I gotta watch this video. See ya. Hey yo, depression meals. Dog edition. <laughs> What do you mean? Yeah, we ran out of um, <laughs> their chicken, so As they gotta do it egg and rice. Hello, welcome to day four of week five. And I'm currently doing the last part of my art appreciation module, and we're talking about Guide Board. And I'm going to share with you some of my favorite quotes from this module. According to the board, pretty much everything that we need in our day to day lives is now already met. Because of this, capitalists have to create more needs and problems in order to find new markets and be able to produce more. And the average consumer today is now more influenced by how much the product can allow him or her to acquire a certain image or prestige than by how much practical use he or she can get from the product. 
This is why the images, design of social media posts, packaging design, models, celebrities that you put beside the product are just as important, if not more important, as the product's quality in increasing the pro producer's profits. Which is so true and applicable today, which is why everything is so aesthetically packaged. And yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. I'm so tired that I read this is furries. The sun will not transgress his measures. If he does, the furries, ministers of justice, will find him out. Yeah, ministers of justice. Hello, it is day five, week five, and I'm just gonna film it like this because the light bounce is less, oh my gosh, um, painful to the eyes because the exposure is all messed up at this time when I do it the other way, so... You're gonna have to deal with this. Anyways, so I plan on, I did my uh, Heraclitus group thing this morning and the individual thing too. So that's done and that part of the module is done for me. And I need to work on my Play-Doh and my group Play-Doh one tomorrow. That's why today I'm going to do my paper that is due tomorrow on Rape of the Lock. So the next few hours I'm gonna be doing that. I got my I got my peanut peanut nips, and I can't wait to finish it. So tomorrow I can do that thing, and on Sunday I can do my art app paper on a piece called Botika na walang gamot, and or is it Botika ng walang gam? I'm sorry, I'll fix that. Um, I'll I'll tell you about it when I do it, and then on Monday. Worst case scenario, I'll be doing the semiotics and structuralism timeline that is due on the day itself. Yay! So, let's freaking go. Don't eat that, please. And I'm gonna have to open the door because Gucci's knocking, as you can hear. And yeah. Uh, everything is kind of going to lockdown again. And there's a curfew again, so it's kind of freaking me out and giving me weird flashbacks from this time of the year last year when I could just feel all my hopes slowly slipping away as each month passed. But you're not here to see that, so see you in the next, um, tomorrow. Hello, it's Saturday. It's, I mean, technically Sunday now. It's 2.18 a.m. I had a long day. Currently editing proofreading and adding my part for one of my subjects. I'm not gonna say what it is because Yo Not to be an asshole, but <sighs> Correcting everyone's grammar is so freaking exhausting and I don't understand what they're trying to say sometimes. When you're in a group, sometimes, like, you don't want to offend people, but you're also like, what is that? So you just don't do anything. I have no idea what I'm reading right now. I can't say anything because it's going to be so obvious. So, yeah. Can I just freaking add that if you're going to do a group work, Steer clear from the convoluted writing style. Like, don't use unnecessary flowery words just to get your point across. Also, try to read what you said again and again and ask yourself, does this sound right? Because it does not sound right to me reading this right now. Hello, it is Sunday of week, uh, week 5. Please ignore the cow socks. Okay, fine, whatever. Just let them stay there. So, I have a few quotes of the week. And by a few, I mean a million. So bear with me because I have to tell you every single one of them because they're so good. So, this one is from On Photography by Susan Sontag. There are one, two, three, four, five, six of them. A photograph passes for incontrovertible proof that a given thing happened. 
The picture may distort, but there's always a presumption that something exists, or did exist. Which is like, what is in the picture? Sorry, it got, it's uh, cropped it the wrong way, so that's why I was like, I paused. Okay, next one. As photographs give people an imaginary possession of a past that is unreal, they also help people to take possession of space in which they are insecure. Which says a lot, because I've honestly been like, finding myself contemplating more than usual on like old photos from like high school and whatever especially because of like there's never anything to do when i'm not <sighs> full of schoolwork okay next people robbed of their past seem to make the most fer fervent picture takers at home and abroad this one made me laugh because it was like so i felt so attacked I take so much photos and videos like when when I hang out with you like not the annoying kind but like the kind of random stuff like stuff on the street honestly like I forget sometimes that I take that many photos wait okay so the next one is lagging okay there Crushed hopes, youth antics, colonial wars, and winter sports are alike, are equalized by the camera. Taking photographs has set up a chronic, voyeuristic relation to the world which levels the meaning of all events. A photograph is not just the result of an encounter between an event and a photographer. Picture taking is an event in itself, and one with ever more peremptory rights to interfere with, to invade, or to ignore whatever is going on. This one is a little bit controversial because of the last part because you know how you're kind of complicit in something that's happening when you're taking a photo but more on that later in the following quotes but the first part i'll just leave you to like take that in honestly it's true everything is equalized by photo photographs it's like reduced to this little thing next after the event has ended the picture will still exist conferring on the event a kind of immortality and importance it would never otherwise have enjoyed it's true especially for like photo albums and stuff like before when you actually had to make an effort and like print the film and everything which was like honestly it's a lot <laughs> so to take a picture is to have an interest in things as they are in the status quo remaining unchanged that's the last one for on photography and that one hit me really hard because it's true like when you take- I, I'm saying like too much, which is a disgrace considering I'm a freaking literature major, so I'm sorry to all my literature professors, but I truly agree, because you ever just- it sounds so 2014 Tumblr, but do, when you take a photo, you kind of just like, you want to be still, and sometimes when you just look at that photo, you're like, you kind of feel that stillness of that moment, and you're just like, transported. I hope I'm not- I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> Another one from my art appreciation class. According to the German poet and playwright Bertolt Brecht, I hope I said that right, or Brecht, I don't know. Art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. That says a lot, especially to me as a musician, because it's true that art is extremely influential and can shape people's lives. And how they see themselves in the th world around them. And this one is from Tom Nicholas' video. <laughs> um, Society of a Spectacle. This one's obviously um, Guy Debord. I don't know if I've already mentioned this, but here. In analyzing the spectacle, we are obliged to a certain extent to use the spectacle's own language. In the sense that we have to operate on the methodologic methodological terrain of the society that expresses itself in the spectacle. The board, 2005, 1967. Uh, this won't really make sense if you don't know what the spectacle is. But here's another one. Art severed from its historical context in this way becomes at once an art of change in the purest expression of the impossibility of change. The goal of the spectacle being to use culture to bury all our historical memory. Now, what I remember from the spectacle is that it's so hard to explain. Um, you should watch Tom Nicholas' video <laughs> about Society of the Spectacle. But what what really stuck out to me 
the most from you know the spectacle thing is how the spectacle takes things that are radical and appropriates it to sterilize it and make it seem less shocking and urgent for example an example would be um let's say feminism if i think that feminism is radical it's political it's important it has to be intersectional it can't be glass ceiling feminism and it needs to it's very in, it's indicative of a lot of underlying problems in society that we don't even notice because it's so ingrained that the system is patriarchal and media just spews out these hashtag girl boss hashtag boss babe hashtag and like you know riverdale type excuse your misogynistic pardon type stuff and like that's not that's just not what it is you know like it makes it seem so dumb and petty that's a way of sterilizing it that's a way of taking something important and making it seem small in the eyes of everyone else like oh okay so that's what feminism is and then people are less threatened by the radicality of it is that a word yeah that's why i love i really want to read more about you know the spectacle and i have a few more this one's from heraclitus and i'm pretty sure i'm about to you know actually this is a video i'll just i'll probably just add this part somewhere in the middle okay here two from today <laughs> from my philosophy class we give birth and soul when we teach or benefit someone in some way our good deed gains a certain immortality living outside our bodies in another the way it happens literally in parturition so my professor said this but i don't think i'm allowed to say his name but he's awesome and he's basically talking about fecundity here spiritual fecundity and no this is a plato symposium about Plato's Symposium. So what I like about this quote is that it's true how, you know, the advice that you give someone, let's say if you die, it kind of just lives on in that person and every single person they pass it through. And I think that's so powerful. That's why I love this quote so much. And I got two more. Okay, here. In perfect symmetry, the last speech, if we don't count Alcibiades, I'm so I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that name, Alcibiades, which is something of an outro that counterbalances the prologue, by Diotima, representing the high point of a dialogue, reiterates and fleshes out the opening insight of Phaedra's speech. The love of- There, I removed the sock so my mom won't get mad at me when she sees this. Um, so, it got cut, but what I was saying was- in perfect symmetry, the last speech, if we don't count Alcibiades, which is something of an outro that counterbalances the prologue by Diotima, representing the high point of a dialogue, reiterates and fleshes out the opening insight of Phaedra's speech. The love of beautiful bodies as, a carnal, as carnal as any impulse of the human condition becomes a kind of rising stare to an appreciation of beauty itself. And beauty leads just as ineluctably to a love of goodness itself. In fact, all love, all desire, she points out, even when it misidentifies an object as beautiful, is really nothing other than love of the good. 206. And that love, even as it is fired by our baser natures, leads inexorably to an inward transformation until we become like the objects we pursue. So the reason why I shared that is because the last part, you needed to hear the whole thing so that you could understand the last part. We become like the objects we pursue. Like, isn't that kind of insane, but also makes so much sense. Like, you keep pursuing, let's say, okay, it doesn't have to be a person either. It can be like, okay, it's so hard to do it with, without using a person. Okay, let's say, um, okay, me, me with, um, Gerard Way. <laughs> this is so true, you're probably, this is so true. This is actually not even an example. This is just real life. I, I keep wanting to be like him. And then sometimes I watch videos of him or like, and then I, it so probably sounds weird, but 
sometimes I watch videos of him and I'm like, wait, why do we act the same now? Like, like what? When did I become this thing? But anyways, uh, that's one way of putting it. It's just you kind of mirror the things that you love and the people that you admire. And you kind of, yeah, just emulate them. It's just, it's just as simple as that. I don't want to be creepy. So Gerard, Gerard, if you see this someday, or anyone from MCR, wow. <laughs> Please don't think I'm weird. Okay. I have two more here. I th was it two more? Wait. Yeah, wait. Yeah? Yeah, okay, two more. Don't give me shit for saying so many quotes, okay? If you have a problem with that, you can leave. I just love certain things in my subjects and actually enjoy learning when it's not killing me half the time okay in pausanias conception love's homosexual conception i.e by one parent indicates the superiority of homosexual love over heterosexuality you have to bracket his sexism provisionally to get his point in his society it was taken for granted that men were both stronger and smarter than women a pederast then was by definition a superior lover because they love the superior person, i.e. another male. His point, sexism aside, is that a lover who is only interested in sexual gratification, completing the sexual act, 182, will choose their victims at random, even preferring ones with neither strength nor intelligence to resist. The superior lover is not primarily concerned with the personal sexual gratification, but with the betterment of their lover. So they will intentionally choose a partner who is virtuous, to a Greek who had not yet been converted to feminism, this meant, by definition, a man. Okay, this one made me laugh, so sir, props to you for making learning so fun, like, with the little j <laughs> humorous stuff here and there. A reason why this is in some of- in part- what? Part of my quotes of the week is because I find it hilarious that- they were so sexist towards women that they straight up would just be gay, but they don't they didn't really understand they don't they didn't have the concept of homosexuality back then. But I think that's kind of funny to me because if you tell this to a if you say this to a modern day bro, like if you say so if you hate women so much and you give them shit for everything they do, why don't you just date a guy and they're like, oh, 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 are you serious, bro? Are you serious? Like, it's literally what they did. So, <laughs> I don't know. It just made me laugh. And the last part, too. Like, it just says a lot. Uh, yeah. It just says a lot about uh, how... They viewed women back then, and they viewed how they viewed men and relationships, and how a lot of this was misconstrued today and forgotten today. Because, you know, as you know, history and society picks and chooses what they want to remain. So, yeah. One more, and probably my favorite quote. Wait, no, I think I have more. Wait, no, I, I have more. Okay, but this is one of the best ones. Aristophanes' speech, like Donald Trump's presidency, it is a joke that got taken seriously. <laughs> I love it. I love it, sir. I love it. So, for context, Aristophanes is that dude who... He's a comedian, basically. But his work was preserved out of everyone else's, which is kind of bad because people took it seriously, the whole finding your other half, completing thing, which is why... Now that I read the text, I deeply regret not editing the group work because I didn't know what I was writing about. I was just proofreading and proofreading. But now I realize that my group is giving in to the notion that there is an other half when really that notion of like completeness, it's false. Um, yeah, so I regret it. 
my tip of the week is probably uh be a good group mate and do your work ahead of time if it involves other people on deadlines okay in my defense sir posted this late so i had to rush which is exactly what i'm doing right now and i still have a bunch of stuff to do that's due tomorrow the art paper the 1000 words and the sutori timeline so i guess i'll just end it there because honestly this is way too long i have a bunch of other stuff that i like but you'll never know so good luck and see you next week <laughs>